We are with Sue Saladakis, and she is the corresponding secretary of the Tingsboro Dunstable Historical Society. So let's start with uh, some town history. Okay. Can we do that? We can. So we'll start with Tingsboro. When was it incorporated? February 23rd, 1809. Tingsboro Incorporated, they broke away from what was left of Dunstable, okay. which was originally uh, many, many acres. The town of Dunstable extended up to Litchfield, New Hampshire, oh. out to Hudson, um, Hollis, parts of Brookline, New Hampshire, and it was a large grant. Ah, okay. And that was, uh, those grants were given uh, land along the Merrimack, the Nashua, and the Sauhegan Rivers in 1660, and Dunstable was incorporated in uh, 1673. Okay, and then eventually Tingsboro broke off from Dunstable. Tingsboro was the last town to break off because along the way they drew a state line. For a brief time there was a Dunstable, New Hampshire. Ah, okay. So. I imagine it was right on the other side of the line. Just on the, the other border. side of the line. Right. So where did the names come from, Tingsboro and Dunstable? Were they named after someone? Oh, or? yes. The, um, <clears throat> some of the original grantees uh, included, well, included um, Jonathan Ting. And his wife actually came from Dunstable, England, which is okay. about 40 miles north of London. It's a great place to go. So that's kind of Dunstable's sister town now? We, we have stayed in touch off and on. We've, we have friends over there. We visited, and, oh. they've, and they visited here. Why did settlers first come to this area? They were looking for places to settle. They were, they were homesteading, and they were, they were moving out from Boston and so forth, and uh, I'm sure that there was financial considerations when you got a grant you petitioned you know this was not granted from the king this was granted from the um, the mass general court the Massachusetts general court mm -hmm. and they said okay you know gentlemen you may have this area and once once they had that then they began to move and encourage people to come and settle mm -hmm. and you were not really a settlement of uh, worth any attention until you had established um, uh, your your meeting house. In a lot of cases that we've seen around the state, um, other towns broke off from other towns because they didn't want to travel so far to go to church, and they had right, to go to church. Right, right, and they would establish their own, and the church and the meeting house were synonymous almost. Okay, know. so that's kind of what happened here as well. I would say, I okay. would say, sure, because if you were up in Brookline, New Hampshire, it was a long way to get down here. Right. And along the way they would, you know, was, uh, when they had enough settlers and so forth. And as time went, I'm sure, if, to start off with, I'm sure everybody did farming, right? Right. To right. sustain themselves. Right. And as things grew, is there some industry that came into this area or no? Well, I suppose at the time it was industry. You had your farms, but you also had your mills. You, you had did. your wheelwrights. You had the people that made what you needed for day-to-day -day living. Yeah. Um, Grain and that kind of thing. Right. right. Dunstable is still actually a farming community in many ways. Okay. We have several large farms. So is the same true with Tingsboro, that it's still a farming not as much. Not as much. Is that because of the highway, maybe? And so, what's going on there? Ah, uh, well, of course, I live in Dunstable, um, but Tingsboro has always been our closest neighbor. We share. We have shared um, youth groups. You know, as a as a kid, um, I went to school when I once I got to high school. I went to school with um, Tingsboro kids. We all went to Lowell. To Lowell High because oh. neither town was big enough to have their own high school. Okay. At that time, and we're, and we're talking '60s. Now? Um, now Tingsboro has uh, a high school of their own. Um, Dunstable is in a um, a regional school with Groton. Okay. Groton Dunstable School okay. District. 
we've worked hard to maintain our green. Tell us about the Little Red Schoolhouse, where we are now. We have a little flyer about the Sarating Winslow Schoolhouse and its, its history. All right, now tell us who Sarah Ting Winslow Sarah is. Sarah Ting Winslow, well you can, you hear the word Ting in the middle, the so she goes back to that original Ting family, mm -hmm. and the schoolhouse was originally located in Tingsboro, in what is now Tingsboro. Okay. At the time it was built, let's see, uh, 1789, it was still Dunstable. It was still one town. Okay. And, um, she gave money and um, so forth uh, for the uh, schoolhouse to be built. And right now, Tingsboro is in the process of renovating their Winslow School, which followed on the heels of the Sarah Ting um, Schoolhouse, Winslow Schoolhouse. Um, so the name has carried along. This was, and you'll see here, this was... Uh, had become a garage. This building? This building had oh. become a garage for someone just up on Kendall Road. Mm -hmm. And um, a group in the Historical Society, the Historical Society was actually begun in the 1940s by a group of, of Tingsboro residents. And um, around the 50s, a group of Dunstable people said, well, instead of having our own, let's, let's go in with them. And they did that. And the society grew. And uh, in the 70s, as we were approaching the bicentennial, uh, a group of members said, you know what we could do? And it was like anything that happens. It starts with a few people. And the Lauders were instrumental in this coming here. Mrs. Lauder, Margaret Lauder, gave the piece of land. And uh, Bill Farrow in Tingsboro, who owned the garage, said, <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> you know, oh, take it. Take wow. it. It's yours. Um, I believe that that's how it worked. And so a group got together, and there's more pictures of them. They took it apart and brought the beams, and oh. they dug a cellar hole and oh. reconstructed the Little Red Schoolhouse. Okay, so they didn't so, just pick it up and move it. No, Ted and Judy Lauder were very instrumental in getting, pulling this project together. It was quite a project. And in 1970, um, I was not personally involved. My, my parents were members of the society. So I'm sure they had a lot of support. Um, mm -hmm. They had a certain amount of financial support. They had volunteers that gave time and their equipment and... Um, that's how it happened. They rebuilt it using as much of the original building as, as was practical. Mm -hmm. The original school was square and had a sloping floor to an aisle which led to the teacher's desk. A dropped pencil or apple would roll down and be spotted by the teacher. Anybody have an apple? We'll take it. <laughs> Whether they actually did the when they recreated it. Um, in 1798, the building burnt. It rebuilt the same year. Um, and Captain Farwell, another big name and, you know, family name, mm -hmm. uh, had it moved further up the road to behind the, uh, the Unitarian Church, which is in the center and has now been completely renovated. Another great stop in the center there. Mm -hmm. um, the new school did not replace any of the existing schools, but offered advanced courses in Latin, Greek, French, algebra, and so on. In, uh, let's see... So 1864, it was being used for storage, and in the 60s, it was given to the town. Did we see a couple outhouses out here? You certainly did. And were those here originally? Or oh, they no, also... they were part of the project. Oh, okay. They were not moved. Okay. They were built as part of the project. Okay. You know, are we going to plumb this? Are we going to have running water? No. We have electricity. You'll see we do have lights. Uh-huh and they put in outhouses. There's another building we've been told about called the barn. Yes. And what is that? And the Dunstable Rural Land Trust began with a group called uh, Dunstable Civic Association. It was a group of citizens who got together and actually bought 
a large piece of property that had been used as it had been a granite, I mean, a um, gravel operation. Yeah, and yeah. one of the more recent um, acquisitions was the McLoon Farm. And across the street, you'll see, a, I think it's a 19, early 1900s craftsman style house, which now belongs to them. And, um, and down the way, just a little bit, you'll see the barn. They have put a lot of time, effort, and they've had some very generous donors. And those oh. people have donated. To rebuild it? To, or or well, it didn't get rebuilt. It's pretty, pretty original. Okay. But it has a new roof, and it has all of that. So the McLoon Barn, worth a, worth a visit. Our, our big event, which we'll do in conjunction with the Royal Land Trust, um, is going to be our strawberry festival. Oh. Best strawberry shortcakes anywhere. We oh. make our own biscuits. That's going to be Saturday, June 22nd, from 10 to 2. Well, we'll let people know. Right. We have a few followers. So is there anybody that we would know, like a famous person who is either born or lives or passed through one a of these towns? Amos Kendall, <clears throat> one of the Kendall family, was uh, involved, I think it may have been the Jackson administration. He was, the, uh, he was a part of that administration. He's um, quite well known. Um, and that's, we're going way back. The yeah. town pound is right on the corner. Okay. Town, you know, in case you have some sheep that got away, you know, we can, we can put them in They'll the town town. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you very much, Sue. It was very fun. Thank you. Well, this is very cool. So go ahead. Is there real water coming out? Oh, yes. Oh, all right. But if... Watch out for the splash. The splash is going to come. It's not going to come out right away. Oh, you are making me work. <laughs> Mom, are we there yet? Yeah. Yay. Yeah. I wasn't fooling.